know about you, but uh, one of the things uh, that happens around Thanksgiving, uh, I have a tradition in my home that until December 1st, we don't put up Christmas decorations. But I know some people, uh, their tradition is on Thanksgiving when they get together to put them up. And I've already seen Christmas trees up and, and different things. And so everybody's trying to get into the holiday spirit. And the merchandisers are hoping you're in the holiday spirit because it uh, pads their uh, pockets pretty good. And so you're going to hear um, in the days ahead of us a lot about the Christmas spirit, being in the Christmas spirit. And you're going to hear things that, that sound very biblical. You're going to hear uh, love, peace, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. You're going to hear about joy and all these things. But you know what? This time of year is a time where suicides increase. Markedly. Depression increases. Dissatisfaction increases. And they try to cover it up with, with songs and buying stuff and a whirl of activity because you know what? The things that we are talking about with the Christmas spirit are spiritual things that only God the Holy Spirit can produce. And so as mankind tries to come up with their cheap imitations, they fall short. And so we try to cover the lack of joy and peace and love in our hearts with alcohol, with possessions, with activities, with with anything to keep us from taking an honest look at do we really have a Christmas spirit? Do we have the spirit, what the spirit produces in our life? And so I put on my heart as we begin this uh, season, heading toward the end of the year and thinking about the Christmas spirit and those type things, uh, the title of the sermon today is In the Spirit. So if you'll turn or look, uh, Ephesians chapter 5.18. Ephesians 5, 18 says this, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. That's the world's way. They're trying to do something to fill that emptiness. It says, but be filled with the Spirit. And this word filled means not a one-time thing, but a continual filling. It's the idea of your water tank uh, underneath your house. You've got a well. You use it in the house and there, your pet well pump comes on and fills that tank back up so that as you need it, you can utilize it. It's a constant thing that has to take place or not. Because we're going to see in the Word of God today uh, some interesting things about being filled with the Spirit. And um, it is a choice that you uh, have to make that has to do with this being filled with the Spirit. So if we could now go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It says this, In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. First thing I want you to understand about if you're going to be in the Spirit, truly have love, joy, peace, and these fruits that we'll look at later on. You must be born again. It is a work of God's Holy Spirit in you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you do not have what God says that only God the Holy Spirit can produce in your life. You are doing cheap imitations. You are doing knockoffs that aren't the real deal. Have you ever been to uh, uh, Chinatown in New York? Have any of you bought knockoff Rolexes? <laughs> Have any of you ever got something that said it was as good as the real deal and then you found out that it wasn't worth a hill of beans and you wasted your money? No this world says that you, without 
Jesus Christ, you can still love, joy, peace, and all the things that we'll look at later on. But the reality is this. You cannot have the genuine article. You will have cheap imitations that leave you flat, leave you dissatisfied, leave you empty. And that's why this world has to try to do something else to fill the emptiness where it says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It is a constant thing, but the first step before you can ever get to be constantly filled is you have to choose Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. This comes by you admitting this. I have no righteousness of my own. I didn't say you weren't a good person compared to me or somebody else. But you know what? If everybody's in a sinking boat and they compare themselves, well, I'm not drowning as much as you are. I'm on a little higher place in the boat than you are. You're all going down on the ship. And so if you compare yourself with someone else, you may come out and say, I'm a pretty good person. But when judgment day comes, do you know who you will be compared to? You will be compared to the righteous, holy God of all time and space, beyond creation, the eternal God who is pure, perfect, and holy. And if you can't match His holiness with your life, you are not going to get into heaven. So, God in His Word tells you up front, if you try to get there by your own goodness, you're going to fail. And He does that in love because He wants you to see that He has a gift for you. He wants to give you His salvation that comes in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit's first work in your life is to show you your need of a Savior. God is not trying to condemn you and call you a no good so and so by telling you're a sinner. He's trying to rescue you from your sin. If people don't realize they're drowning, they're not going to allow somebody to pull them out of the water. If they don't realize they're sick, they're not going to go to a doctor and get the right medicine. And so when God's Holy Spirit says, I want you to understand, you're lost and you're on your way to hell. God's not trying to put anybody down. He's trying to rescue you. And you cannot be in the Spirit without responding to the Holy Spirit, showing you your need of God's salvation and understanding that God in a human body is Jesus Christ. And He took the punishment for your sin on that cross and He rose again to show that He can offer you eternal life in Him. And He can make you His righteousness. Not pretend. He will transform you and you will have a new birth. I am the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, if I've trusted Christ as Savior, and I know I have. Now, we're going to look at a struggle later on that has to do with walking in the Spirit. But right now, you can't even have the Spirit unless you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. And you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Um, when you get saved, you get all of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit may not get all of you, and I'm going to explain that in just a second. But I want you to understand, if you're saved, God the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, in your soul, your spirit. And we're going to look at the dynamics of that. Galatians chapter 5. So if you turn to Galatians chapter 5, or you can watch it up there. I'm not turning you back there on my side. Everything's close together, so I can get there a little quicker uh, with sticky pages. Verse 16 of Galatians 5 said, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. I want you to understand that walking in the Spirit or being in the Spirit is a choice that can change that quick. You see, my light went off. You see, it came on. You see, it went off. Came on. You can be walking in the Spirit one moment and you can flip a switch and not be walking in the Spirit the next. If you say, well, I went and I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so I'm good. It's a choice. The flip. The flip. The flip. It is a moment by moment choice because here we. I, got, I need to lie. There we go. Thank you, Lord. Uh, you must make a choice to journey in your life. That's why it didn't say you're already sealed with the Holy Spirit, but walking in the Spirit means each moment of life that I'm existing in in that moment, 
I need the Holy Spirit to be in me functioning. If not, I am walking in the flesh. Do you know what walking in the flesh means? Number one, it means that you are under the control and influence of demons. You say, I am not. Well, if you're not controlled by the Holy Spirit, what spirit do you think is controlling you? Well, I'm under my spirit. That explains it. You are a rebel, and you are a rebel against God, and you have aligned yourself with demons, and they are sucking in that rebellious spirit. Just like when Eve chose to eat the fruit, and Adam chose to eat the fruit, they were rebelling against God, and they gave up the ownership of this earth, where now Satan is the prince and the power of this air, the spirit that ruleth. And so what's happening in this world is influenced by demonic power. And most of us don't like to think of it that way because we think we're pretty good people. After all, I'm saved. Well, you may have chose just right then to not walk in the Spirit by saying, that Blaine, he is so good than that, you started judging me. Aha! Walking in the Spirit is a moment-by-moment moment choice. Now, if you think you can make that choice without a fight, you are going against Scripture. If you're saved, you do not want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. I don't want to have a terrible Christmas. I don't want to go through Christmas and be all mm, blood, uh, screwed. I want to celebrate what we're supposed to be celebrating. Now, if I'm, if there are secondary things I'll be celebrating, but if that becomes the primary, you know, Christmas is really not very satisfying. You can't wait till it gets over because it's a headache and a heartache. It's more pain than it's worth. Well, that shows me, once again, you're not in the Christmas spirit. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Any time in any situation that you're presented in with life as you walk, if I walk here, there's going to be a demonic spirit trying to influence me, and the Holy Spirit is going to be doing certain things we're going to talk about in a minute. And I have a choice to make. You will never be able to have a thought or a feeling without there being a fight. <coughs> there always is going to be a fight. Of what are you going to allow controlling you? <coughs> These are contrary to one to the other. They're opposites. There is no making peace between the two. There is no third option. You're walking in the Spirit or you're walking in the lust of the flesh being influenced by demons so they can get you in an unblessable situation so they can kill, rob, and destroy from your life and then blame it on God. You cannot do the things you would. When I want to obey God, Satan is working on me. When I want to give in to the flesh, the Holy Spirit is working on me if I'm saved. We're going to look at that in a minute. But it is a choice. It is a battle. It is a moment-by-moment -moment thing. It is not something you can do one time and just not pay attention to. You've heard me say so many times in the 25 years, every thought originates, every emotion originates from one or two things, either the Spirit of God or a demonic spirit, and which one you embrace then becomes recorded in your brain with your thought your emotion. And you better start paying attention to what's going on in your head. What's going on in your emotions. Because when you don't, I guarantee you, you will walk in the flesh and Satan will begin manipulating you. And oh, you'll come to church, but it will be less... Forgive me for using a smoking thing, but I, as a boy, I grew up in tobacco country in North Carolina. There was a commercial... Uh, it might have been Marlboro or Paramount or something... Are you smoking more and enjoying it less? You're smoking the wrong brand. If you're coming to church and reading your Bible and doing these things and enjoying it less, the problem's not with the Bible. And it may not even be the church. It may be that you're walking in the flesh and you're dissatisfied. You're dissatisfied. You know, if I could turn your switch for you, I would. There's only one switch I can turn and that's for me. It's a, it's a battle. Next thing I want you to see in, in Galatians chapter 5 is the fruit of the Spirit, verse 22. How do I know if I'm walking in the Spirit? How do I know if, if I'm in the Spirit? 
Here you have you know. Every thought is governed by love. Oh, I'm not just the human love. Because people have asked me, well, and we'll talk about the answer to this. Well, unsafe people can be loving. Unsafe people can have joy. They can have peace. We're going to talk about that in, in later on down the road. But I want you to see the standard. Are all your thoughts based out of love? And this is a sacrificial love, an unconditional love that says, I'm going to love you even if you're the biggest jerk in the world to me. I love you without any expectation of return of favor toward me. I'm going to love you because you need to be loved. Love. Joy. Joy is different from happiness. Happiness means you like what's happening to you, and a lot of times I don't. But joy is the reality that if God allows it to happen to me, I have a spirit of expectation that God's going to turn it into good that is worth whatever I have to go through. And I know that there is a present at the end of this journey, this whatever I'm having to deal with. There is a pearl that may have started off as a grain of sand in, my, in between my flesh. But God's going to turn it into a pearl. Joy. Peace. That confidence that God's in control and I'm in the right relationship with God and others. That it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Long suffering. Being able to put up with things that cause you pain without it getting on your nerves. How many times I hear people, you get on my last nerve. Well, put your nerves deeper in your skin. Mm -hmm. Now, should I straighten up and not get on your nerves? Absolutely. How many times have I heard parents correct their child? You're getting on my nerves right now. Is that a right reason to discipline the kids? All that is, it says, I'm selfish and because you're bugging me, I'm going to make you do. Guess what? They're going to grow up. And they're going to tell you, hey, you can't make me do anymore. Mm. So I'm getting on your nerves now. You get on mine, so I'm leaving you. Long suffering, gentleness, a sensitivity with people, to not do any harm, to be aware of the, the, the pain. You know, uh, you can deal with people in a way, that, in an area that they need to, to have worked on. You can deal with them in a gentle, kind way. If you've ever had a nurse that's taken blood, you may have had one that was good and one that just jabbed it in there and sucked it out like a vampire. i got to give you this. This wasn't a nurse, but this was one time I almost hit a doctor. This is no lie playing basketball for our college team and my knee got knocked out of joint. And so um, after the game, I just, I, I was on the sidelines there in pain. I needed somebody to drive me to the, to the hospital emergency room. So after the game, so it had really tightened up. It really tightened up. It was out of joint. So I'm there. They, they finally get me into a waiting uh, um, space and it's cold makes it tighten even more. And I'm sitting in there for about 45 minutes. Some guy, and this course is about 11 o'clock at night because we're playing late at night. This guy comes in, doesn't even look at me. All of a sudden says, I, says so your, your knee popped out of joint. And he grabs my knee and starts to check the stability. I know what he was doing. I understand what he was doing. But he had no regard for what he shot through me. And when he took that knee, I just instinctively, because I had older brothers growing up. I instinctively drew back and had I not consciously said, Dwayne, don't punch this guy. But he realized that he had just caused me extreme pain. Gentleness. Do you deal with people? Do people think that you deal with them gentle? Well, they need to hear it. Well, they probably do need to hear it. But how you say it has a lot to do with it. Gentleness. Goodness. Goodness means I'm always about the profit of the other one. Goodness, faith. Do you have the ability as part of the fruit of the Spirit to just trust God? To just say, you know, God's going to work His thing out. It's going to be okay. I don't see it out, but I'm going to trust God. I'm just going to do it. Faith, meekness. Meekness means allowing others to go first. Let me ask you, who got turkey first at your house? Are you the one that says, well, let them wait. I'm hungry. Meekness is saying, I would rather other people's needs get met first. I'm still going to get my needs met, but I'm going to put them before me. Meekness, temperance, self-control. 
now I'm not looking at baselines, but we can check on self-control in a lot of different ways. But what I'm saying is, when God's Holy Spirit is in control of you, all your thoughts and all your emotions have these characteristics. It's easy to check if you pay attention to what you're thinking. It's easy to check if you're paying attention to what you're feeling to know, is it love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, or is it the works of the flesh which you can look at? And what you're going to find is we walk in the flesh a whole lot. We really do. And we wonder why we don't have any power with men or with God. An unsaved person can act like most Christians. You know why? Because a Christian without walking in the Spirit isn't able to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And so, I haven't done... I haven't done this, but let's pretend that you just came in and you didn't know about this light. And I ask you, is this light broken or is it fixed? Is it good or is it bad? Well, until I turn it on, you really won't know. And so do you know what I know? A light that works acts just like a broken one until the power is on. And unsaved people and Christians act pretty much the same. Unless the power of God is at work in your life with the Spirit controlling you. Unsaved people can do what say, but no wonder they don't think they have to come to church. No wonder they don't think they really need Jesus. Because they match it pretty well. A light bulb is broken and a light bulb with no power. Pretty much the same. Verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with, with the affections and lusts. You have to make a choice to say, am I Christ? Do you know who you are in Christ? If you want to be an angry person, if you want to be a self-centered person, if you want to be these things that aren't the fruit of the Spirit, you don't know Jesus Christ to save you. But if you want to be these things, even though you're not, you're struggling to do that, I want you to see part of walking in the Spirit is identifying, this is not me. This is the old me. This is the dead me. This is before salvation me. But this is not who I am. I want to be like Jesus. I want to exhibit His heart, His mind, His ways. That's who a Christian really is. Every Christian in their heart, that's, that's the center of our heart. We desire that. But only the Spirit can pull it off. And as we go on, we're going to look at two things you can do that turn it, the Spirit off. Uh, I won't turn there, just I'll look up here. Uh, Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Um, Hunter, would you be my volunteer? Come on up here. Now, let's see. Yeah, I'm going I'm to need you. And, and I'm, I'm going to have to whisper something where we won't go on the microphone. Let's see how much money i got to offer some money. <laughs> Not to you, sorry. <laughs> i got a $10, I got a, I know, $10 bill. If you can tell me what he says, first one to hand up that can tell me, um, I'll give a ten dollar bill to. No, I want you to say it in normal voice. But wait till I say now. Now. <laughs> What did he say? Take your hand off my mouth. <laughs> Last time. What? What did I say? What did I tell you to say? He wants to send out a bill. Did you understand at that time? What was the difference? My man, hand. Oh, excuse me, I got I know. My hand was over his mouth. The word. Grieve means to sadden, to, to, to muffle, to hold back, to restrain. 
when you breathe the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to be talking to you and telling you things. Some people tell me, Dwayne, how do you hear God talking to you? And He doesn't talk to me. God talks to all His children. He does. But, if you have walked in the flesh and God's Spirit has talked to you and you sort of mm, started to rationalize and discount, you allow other voices to muffle the voice of the Holy Spirit. And you can't clearly hear what God's saying to you. That's why getting alone with God, getting quiet with God, even doing some fasting and some time. One of the things I love about honey, I went out faithfully. And no, I didn't shoot you. But, people I were with you, point being, I went out faithfully. But you know, I enjoyed it. You know why? Because I had my normal prayer time, but I'm also, since I was out there hunting a little longer, since I was off school, um, I just sort of sat before the Lord and we talked about anything and everything. Man, was that so good. Just such a peace and joy and all the fruit of the Spirit. And... and and I said, Lord, you, you know how you are when you're in the woods and the leaves are damp and you're trying to hear a deer, or a baby cry, which is fine, uh, hear a deer walk and, and, let, and the Holy Spirit said to me, do you listen that hard when I'm talking to you? Do you wait that long to see what I'll say to you? That was one of the things the Holy Spirit said to me. I said, Lord, help me to strain hard to hear what are you saying? And be willing to wait long because I know you're going to speak to me. So we can grieve and then if you grieve God's Spirit enough, it comes to quench not the Spirit. These are things that you can choose to do that cause you. If you, what happens to a light bulb if you turn it on and off and on and off and off? It, it quicker wears out the filament. In quenching the Spirit, it's the idea of having a fire. The Scripture says it's, it's like you have a fire and you start pouring water on it and dampen and beat the flame down. Many times we have told the Holy Spirit no. We've rationalized around the Holy Spirit where, where we get to the point where we quench God's Holy Spirit. And you know what God does at the point when you've quenched His Spirit? You women have done this with your husband. You've told him and tried to correct him and, and given him advice and you just step back because he ain't going to listen until he comes to the end of his rope and realizes it ain't going to work. You know God's Spirit, when we quench His Spirit, does that. We get to the point where we've damped it and God's Holy Spirit has tried to warn us, tried to give us instruction, tried to communicate to us and He finally says, listen, I'm here to help you. Obviously, you don't want my help. I'll stand aside. It doesn't mean I'm lost. It doesn't mean that I'm not saved anymore, but here's what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's just going to stand there quiet. Now, husbands, don't wish you wish some of your wives worked that way. But anyway, let's keep going and not get bogged down. But the Holy Spirit will say the only way for this person to learn is for them to allow their own wrong choice of walking in the flesh to jump up and bite them and cause them pain and difficulty. You know, we're not too smart. It's amazing the pain that we will put up with and assume that that's the normal Christian life. And it's not. We are not walking in the Spirit when these things are happening. That's not what God died and rose again for us to enjoy. We are people who are supposed to have an abundant life, a full and overflowing life that exhibits the fruit of the Spirit constantly. But we can quench God's Spirit where He said, I'm going to allow your circumstances to beat up on you until you're ready to listen. When you're ready to listen, truly ready to listen, not just to get you out of the bad circumstances of your bad choices, because then you don't learn anything. You go right back to another bad choice. When you realize you need me not to just get you out of the mess you're in, but to help guide and direct your life, come talk to me. And we'll begin a discussion. Till then, I got nothing more to say to you. I've said all I want to say. Preach it, brother. And that's where we're at in the walking with the Spirit. It is a choice. It is a choice that we got to make, and we can make it. And and we all struggle with walking in the Spirit. It is a fight, but don't let it become the pattern of your walk, the pattern of your life. That's miserable Christian living. There is nothing more miserable than a Christian out of fellowship with the Lord. He can't enjoy the world and he can't enjoy spiritual things. He just beat the crap 
It's just miserable living. He's still going to go to heaven, but it's miserable living. John 16, uh, verses 8 through 11. Talks about the job of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying to his disciples, talking about the Holy Spirit, that when he is coming, those are the, what the Holy Spirit's going to do in your life, in your walk. First of all, we're talking about sin. <coughs> the Holy Spirit, for you to be in the Spirit, you're going to have to respond the right way when God says you just did something wrong. Keep short accounts with God. When you mess up, say, yes, sir, I messed up and I'm sorry. I don't want to do that again. Would you please help me? But if you say, well, I, it's really the other person's fault. Well, well, they need to change. So I don't care what you come up with. When the Holy Spirit says there's an issue of sin that you've got to deal with and you run from the Holy Spirit in doing that, you're not going to walk with the Spirit. You're going to get in that grieving and quenching thing. A lot of people can't walk with the, with the Lord and in the Spirit because they, they are not submitting in this area of this sin that's in their life. That's why God says if you've got sin in your heart, don't take communion. If there's an unresolved thing. Because when you come to God to fellowship with God, God doesn't want any type of issue. Have you ever tried to kiss your mate when there was an unresolved problem? Got a marriage license and you know you love each other, but you know what? That kiss is not going to be probably happening, and if it does, it's definitely going to lack a whole lot. Why? Because you can't have fellowship and relationship if there's unresolved issues. And part of the job of the Holy Spirit is to point out sin. Second thing, of judgment. Judgment is like uh, the guy at a, at a county fair and there are pies up there. Judgment is good pie, better pie, go away pie. <laughs> judgment, God's Holy Spirit will work in you to help you make the right decisions. Do you know one of the greatest tools of Satan is to cause you to accept good instead of best? Let that sink in. That hits me a lot. There are a lot of people who walk with God and want good. And let's be honest, here in America, it's the, it's, it's the sin of the church. God is still giving good blessing. But our country is going down the tubes and it's because God's people have not humbled themselves and prayed and sought His face and turned from their wicked ways. He said, if you do that, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin and I will heal your land. God's waiting on us. But you know, things are pretty good. They have been better, but they're not so bad. The enemy of best is good. And so, as we are led by the Spirit, God says, I want you to choose those excellent things, Philippians 1 says. Choose those excellent things. And so, we will have the quality and quantity of God's blessing based on our willingness to make the decisions that the Holy Spirit is telling us. How many of you have ever had a prompting in your, uh, uh, just about something small, but a prompting in your mind you ignored it, and because of that, something happened in your life that day that made it uncomfortable, or you missed an opportunity or something, you say, hey, gun it, the Holy Spirit was talking to me, and I missed it. I've had that happen. Too many times. Um, Lord, please help me with this again. Please help me with this again. We need to learn to listen. God will bring us to right choices, the excellent choices, if we'll listen to Him. And lastly, um, it talks about uh, a judgment because you know, the uh, Satan, the prince of this world, is judged. Do you know in every day, right now, Demons are laying a trap for you today. I've used this many times uh, with uh, paintball and other discussions. If I told you right now that you're on the hit list and there are snipers outside of this building and as soon as you walk out that door when they got a shot, they're going to take it. Well, guess what? In the spirit real reality, that's true. You're a threat to Satan if you're a blood-bought believer. And if you're wanting to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, that makes you an even bigger threat. 
And Satan has studied you, plotted and planned. Where are their weaknesses? How can I manipulate them? How can I get them to make small choices to walk in the flesh and parlay that into bigger choices till I can get an opening to blow a hole in their life? Blow a hole in their testimony. Many a pastor, according to statistics, I don't know, but 80% of ministers are hooked on pornography. Satan will parlay on one little glance or one small thing and he'll reel you in just like a fisherman. I want you to know the Holy Spirit will let you use the Joseph principle. Joseph, when he was in Egypt and, and sin incarnate in a good looking woman who was saying, have sex with me right now, I'm hot for you. He ran out of his cloak. There are times where God says the best solution is feet don't fail me now. And so when we listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, we don't leave ourselves open for Satan to be able to kill, rob, and destroy. We need to walk in the Spirit. That's what God will do throughout our life. But you know I said earlier that we were going to look at, well, unsaved people can love and joy and peace and blah, blah, blah. We come to the last verse, set of verses that I'm going to look at, which is Galatians 5. 25 and 26. It says, If we live in the Spirit, which means if you're, if you're a Christian, let us also walk in the Spirit. That means constantly choosing to make that choice. It will be constant in your life because there's constant pulling of demons and Satan and life will pull at you to respond to it. Here's why unsaved people cannot walk in the Spirit. Or Christians that are saying, I can be loving and have peace without being empowered by the Holy Spirit or completely right with God. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. You know why this world loves? For their glory. You know why they want to do good? For their glory. A Christian who is empowered by the Holy Spirit has one and only one desire. I want my Lord to be glorified in what I choose this day, what I think this day, what I feel this day, how I react to circumstances, how I react to obnoxious people, how I react to a sin or attack in any form or fashion. I want my Lord to be glorified in my mind and in anybody watching my life that God is the one who deserves the praise, the honor. He is the power of my life. When the Holy Spirit is in control of you, you want that more than anything. And you will be able to do that when God's glory one of the things that I find in Christians is we want to do all these things so we can come in Sunday and everybody say, wow, he met a great Christian. Yeah, he's a great kid. He's a wonderful preacher. He does all these wonderful things. Let's hear it for God. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto this world. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, it's about God and God alone. So, are you in the Spirit? Let's pray. Father.